few seconds of awkward silence. All right, welcome everybody to the introduction to deep learning guest lecture. It's also a special episode of the To My Eye lecture series. And it's a real pleasure to have Ben Poole here. Uh, so Ben Poole is a research scientist at Google Brain. He is working on deep generative models and understanding of neural networks. Um, he did his PhD at Stanford University and um, he has done really a lot of cool stuff recently, specifically the dream fusion work. A lot of people might've heard about is essentially combining the really famous 2D diffusion works with actually 3D scene representations. And this I think was one of the most remarkable achievements in the last few years and has led to a really big breakthrough in the community, like how we use big pre-trained models in order to generate 3D content. So I'm really happy to have you here today, Ben. Um, I promised also we should ask for interruptions. We should ask questions during the talk. So if you have any comments, just go ahead, post them on YouTube, post them in Zoom and let me know. So stage is yours, Ben. Awesome. Um, thank you, Matthias, for the kind introduction. And um, I feel really honored that you guys are willing to stay up late uh, to learn about some of the work that we've been doing on 2D and 3D generation. Um, and this was work done with a, a really huge cast of amazing collaborators here at uh, Google. Um, and I think it covers a lot of some of what I'm excited about right now in generative models. And I know it's hard to do over Zoom, especially at this hour, but please interrupt me with any questions that you have. I think uh, it sounds like it's a really interesting audience here, um, and I'm sure that there'll be details and things that I miss or that I confuse people with. So happy to make this a little bit more interactive if we can do that. So as a, a bit of a little bit of background, um, back in 2014, um, I spent a lot of time working on image generative models. And these were the state of the art samples that you might get back then. Uh, for, for image generation. And you'd squint at these and say the, the color di distribution looks pretty good, the textures look pretty good. Um, but since then, it's been really incredible to see what the, the field of folks doing research in the space have been able to achieve. Um, in particular, going from um, GANs and VAEs in 2014 um, to methods like Pixel CNN, um, Big GAN, and Imagine, um, you can really see an improvement in quality. Something that is a little odd to me on the Zoom, I don't actually see the images. Do you guys see images? But oh, there we go. Um, sorry, a little bit of latency here. Um, but yeah, it's been really incredible to see the progress over the past almost 10 years and what we can do in image generation. And I think last year was really astounding for myself, even having been in this field for so many years, to see just the, the number of methods and uh, kind of models that were developed for image and video generation. So we had methods like Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, Party, Imagine. Um, Dolly 2, and we've also seen not just text and image generation explode, but also video generation with methods like uh, make a video, imagine video, and Benaki. Um, so it's really incredible what we can do right now. Um, and I think it's hard, if, especially if you're new to this space in this area, uh, just seeing how far we come, I think has been incredible. And we, it does really feel like we're now at this point where I can just come up with anything that I want uh, to create based off of text. For example, an elephant wearing a birthday hat and using a variety of these methods can get out a pretty high quality 2D image of this concept that I have in my head. And I'm a very horrible artist. My sister's kind of this amazing uh, artist in the family. So I find it very enlightening that some of the AI research that I've been doing can enable some of these really uh, exciting generations. And it's not just 2D these days. I think we've also seen how advances in text to video generation can enable uh, dynamic content. So here's a happy elephant wearing a birthday hat walking under the sea. Um, and I think there's this question you can ask, well, how did 2D generative models become useful? What's happened over all these years? Um, I like to think that it's been amazing progress and methods and a bunch of smart researchers toiling away. But I think the reality is that uh, there's been a lot of investments into larger scale data sets that have really led a lot of these advances. We've also seen ways of taking all these different machine learning models developed in different domains, like for text processing, uh, and using these pre-trained models for generation has been really key to some of the success of some of these recent methods. I think last, and I think uh, closer to the work that I know about very well is uh, this idea of diffusion models or a new particular kind of methodology for training high dimensional generative models that has really enabled uh, several of these advances. But I think any advance that you put enough work into in terms of scale and data, you could also get these kinds of results out. Uh, and kind of reflecting back on that slide I had before on this project in terms of image generation, uh, a lot of this has been driven by data. So when I was working on these problems back in 2014, uh, we worked with around 50,000 images from 10 classes on CIFAR 10. 
And this is a really challenging data set to work with because there's a lot of diversity in these 32 by 32 images and you don't have very many of them. Um, and then I guess for the past you know, five years or so, a lot of people were focused on generation on ImageNet, which had around a million images and a thousand different classes. And then I think a lot of the recent progress has been driven by a shift towards larger scale web data sets trained on billions of images um, and not just using the particular classes assigned to them, but using these richer text captions that can help to uh, point to more content in the images. And then also gives you this amazing creative control over what you can generate. If I have a, a thousand ImageNet classes, then I can kind of create a thousand different things with some expert tuning. But if I have text, then kind of anyone can plug in and try out these systems. Um, so that's kind of the, the background a little bit on, I think, the data sets and what's enabled a lot of the work on image generation. And I want to spend a bit of time going through, well, what are these diffusion models? Because it's going to be key to how we're going to use them for 3D generation later. Um, and I guess in this class, have you guys seen diffusion models yet? Or is this a, a first? Um, so the diffusion models is something that I think most PhD students, they definitely know it. And they're working very actively on a lot of this research. Um, the students who are taking currently introduction to deep learning. Um, so we introduced the fusion models in the very last lecture. So if they have seen the lecture, which I uploaded yesterday, <laughs> um, then they know it. So you might have to give a very quick. Awesome, impression. awesome. I'll give I'll give a quick overview. Um, I think uh, definitely definitely watch that amazing lecture. I'm sure on diffusion models. And there's also been a bunch of really great tutorials uh, over the years at CDPR. Um, if you're interested in in getting up to speed on diffusion models and also learning about some of the really cool applications that they've enabled. But the, the general idea is, I think, pretty simple. We're going to start off with some data set, um, for example, a data set of images. And we're going to have this fixed process that takes the single data point and adds more and more noise. Um, so we start off with this highly structured, high quality photo of a puppy on the left. And then we're going to add more and more noise to it. And at the end of this destructive process, all that's left is noise. And we kind of know how to model noise. It's just going to be a simple fixed Gaussian distribution. And what do these models learn? Well, they're trying to learn how to reverse this process, how to go from random noise all the way back to a high quality image. But what's nice about these diffusion models is it's not just doing this in one shot, mapping from random noise all the way back to something that looks good. It's broken down into these sequence of simple steps, going from a noisier image to a less noisy image. And I think this is kind of key to why a lot of uh, this diffusion method methodology really works is we found a way of taking a really complicated problem and breaking it down to a, a bunch of small steps. And neural networks are pretty good at learning when you have a lot of data and a pretty well-defined task. So this is a way of exploiting that um, in the context of this extra uh, kind of noise process in the image space. And diffusion models are kind of like the name that people use for these things. There's uh, also been a lot of amazing work on score-based generative models. Um, and there's different perspectives for thinking about this class of generative models. But right now, it's kind of a, a pretty powerful tool when you want to model high dimensional continuous distributions. Um, and as I was saying, I think these diffusion models, uh, they're learning to reverse this process. Well, what are they actually learning? Um, you can think about uh, maybe a fixed number of steps or a fixed number of discrete noising steps where we start off with the clean image on the left. And then we have this kind of forward destructive process Q that adds more and more noise to the image. And the diffusion model is learning how to reverse each step of this process. Um, and in practice, what does this architecture look like? Well, in pixel space, these diffusion models are just denoising autoencoders or kind of denoising units where they have as input a noisy image and they're given some additional conditioning signal. For text to image generation, we condition on text. And for all diffusion models, you also condition on the amount of noise. So it says uh, not only that there is a noisy image, but you get to know how much noise was added. And then the goal of this unit is to just denoise the image, to try to predict well, what was the clean image before I added noise to it? Um, and another perspective on these diffusion models, which is uh, more popular in the score-based generative modeling literature, is well, we're not just learning this discrete set of steps that we're reversing, we're actually learning a sequence of distributions. And so on the left-hand side of this figure, we have a kind of your clean distribution of images. Um, and if you look at this distribution, it's often really peaked. And this is a really complex high-dimensional space with uh, you know, maybe you have a manifold structure, so you have regions in the image space that are really likely and regions that are really unlikely. And that can be really hard for a neural network to model. But as we add more and more Gaussian noise to the input image, this is convolving this distribution with a smoothing kernel or with this kind of Gaussian smoothing, and it becomes simpler and easier to model. Um, and so when we train this diffusion model, we also get out access to the sequence of distributions going from the clean data distribution on the left all the way to a Gaussian noise distribution on the right. 
Um, and as, as I was saying before, we have these units that are learning how to denoise an image. Um, so here, x hat is just denoting the estimate of the denoised image given some noisy image ZT at the time step T in this diffusion process. And we can think about these units not just as learning the denoised image, but also as learning a prediction of the noise that was added. Um, so what was the noise that mapped from this less noisy thing back to the noisy thing? Um, and there's a simple relationship between this predicted noise and the score function. Uh, and in this context, what does a score function mean? Uh, well, we have this kind of sequence of distributions and the score function, this uh, grad ZT of the log probability, this is just telling us which direction should I move to go to higher likelihood states. So along with this denoising model, we also have the ability of taking a noisy image and perturbing it to get an image that has kind of higher likelihood according to this model. So this is a nice feature of diffusion models that we're gonna come back to later for trying to use them for 3D generation. And in practice, we often don't just train a single diffusion model, maybe we have a cascader set of them. So the imagined text to image model um, has a few different components. The first is it uses a pre-trained uh, transformer model to take a text embedding, a photo of a group of teddy bears eating pizza in Times Square, and it maps it through a frozen text encoder to get a frozen set of text embedding. So this is where we're taking advantage of this pre-trained text model trained on a lot of text beyond just what we have in these image text data sets. Um, and the first diffusion model that's used in Imagine goes from the text embeddings and random initial noise to a 64 by 64 image. And then we have a, a series of two different super resolution diffusion models that take us input now this low res 64 by 64 model and upsamples it to 256 by 256, and then another one that goes right to 1024 by 1024. And most of the state of the art image generation models in pixel space uh, have this kind of cascade structure. It's using this nice inductive bias. Um, of multi-scale generation that is useful in a lot of different areas of computer vision. Um, but we've also seen there's a lot of other ways of structuring and using diffusion, not just in pixel space, but in latent space. Uh, so latent diffusion models um, uh, from Robin and Andreas are, is this great work that enables more efficient and compact generation in a latent space. So instead of just modeling your high dimensional pixel distribution, you can first learn an encoder that maps to a low dimensional latent space and a decoder that maps back. Um, and now you have this compressed latent representation. And once you have this compressed latent representation, you can just treat that like a data set and then fit something like a diffusion model in that latent space as well. Um, and you can, of course, condition these things on anything you have access to. Maybe you have a data set of text and images so you condition on, uh, on the text, but you could also imagine having some kind of semantic labeling, or there's been some really cool recent work for a 3D generation where maybe you have some 3D key points. Uh, and so it's really cool what you can do once you have these diffusion models and then fine tune and adapt them onto different kinds of data sets. Uh, here's an example of like the kinds of text images uh, that you can create. I encourage everyone to play around with these systems because I think there's a lot of really amazing examples of what kinds of image generations you can get out if you play around with the system a lot. But when you try it on your own, you see that there are, are ways in which these generative image models are really good and ways in which they're really bad. Um, and I think understanding where they work and don't work is really critical to thinking about how to advance them and remove some of the biases that you see present in them. Um, this is an example from Irina Block, who's an amazing designer at Google, uh, of toilet paper with real cactus spikes. Um, and I don't, I really hope that these things don't actually exist in the world, and yet these generative image systems are really able to produce pretty realistic content. Um, and after seeing all the amazing work in text to image generation, a bunch of us were uh, thinking, well, what about video? You know, why, you know, we have this teddy bear washing dishes on the left. It doesn't look like it's doing too much washing. It looks like it's just kind of sitting there smiling at the camera. How do we go from static scenes or static content to dynamic content? Um, and I think it was a tremendous amount of challenging engineering work and data set work, but the, the fundamentals are pretty simple. Um, all that we need to do is to find a large scale data set of high quality videos along with text captions. And then we can take these amazing 2D image models that have been adapted for text image models um, and add in some extra layers to make them work for video. And in particular, we can take this 2D unit structure that we use for images and add it, and we can run those kind of independently on each frame of a video, but then we have interactions through a temporal attention mechanism uh, at different points in this unit model. And that enables us to reason over not just single images, but over a whole set of images or a video. Uh, and combined with a few extra tricks can, can lead to some really compelling video generative results. So here's a glass bead falling into water with a huge splash sunset in the background. 
And you can think about it, if you actually wanted to build a, a physically accurate model of what was happening here, that would be tremendously expensive. And while these video generative models are pretty slow and expensive at the moment, um, they can really fake a lot of incredible content and produce really compelling dynamic scenes. And going back to our elephant, I think uh, there's really, you know, I, I think seeing these is really incredible, but at the same time, there's a lot of, if you look at any of these video generative models, there's a lot that's not quite right. Um, so you can see maybe hard over zoom and compression artifacts, but um, if you look at the front legs of this elephant, they're often swapping back and forth. So there's a lot of non-rigidity that doesn't make any sense um, in the generation. And the tusk, which should really be a solid object, is wiggling around. And the lighting doesn't really make sense in terms of what's going on either. So these video general models are getting better, but it's not clear to me that they're going to really understand the 3D structure of the world. Uh, and we don't just want to create these 2D pixel space uh, images and video, I think we want to do so much more. There's a lot of cool work going on right now in AR, VR, um, and in games. And you want not just 2D things, you really want 3D things. And some of the most fun I've had um, in life has been trying to create things in 3D. Um, here's a picture of me trying to create a dinosaur out of clay um, from when I was younger. And what I learned was that it's really challenging to create 3D content. Um, we know that 3D modeling on computers, if anyone has tried that, is so it's it's such a challenging process. Um, and my hope is that we could maybe take some of the advances in image and video generation and use them to create things that are in uh, 3D. And right now, it's I think the technology is at a point where the systems that my text to 3D models can create are way better than anything that I could craft myself. So I think that's um, been really fun to to go from just some simple idea in my head to some text to actually getting it 3D printed and and having that there in your hand that you can see. Um, so how are we going to build 3D generative models? I and mean, maybe before I dive in, is there any questions on the 2D side, on the image or video or diffusion models? Um, there were a couple of questions. I tried to answer a few of them. So I don't know. Maybe you can you can talk a little bit about like video specifically, right? Like the most of these models are actually trained on images. Like how do you like? Can you say a few words how how this would extend to videos actually? Yeah, I think the main I guess a few things. So, so we've seen a lot of cool work like Align Your Latents where we may want to adapt these image models to video because the image models have learned a lot about the structure of individual frames. So we probably don't want to just train from scratch for building powerful video generative models. And I think for video, I still personally have a lot of questions. I'm not sure what the right approach is. I think that you know, in some ways you might want to have reasoning about the 3D world to do high quality video generation. But in other ways, I worry that baking in too many of these architectural inductive biases for the architectures that we use for video generation uh, is maybe not the right path. The same way that for building high quality 2D image generative models, we didn't have to do things like have a lot of like structured scene layout um, and disentangled representations. I'd worked on that for many years thinking it was critical for image generation and it seems like text was all we really needed to get out these disentangled uh, or somewhat disentangled generative models. So I think for video, I think there's still so many questions around the types of architectures that you could build and how to make them efficient. I think there's also questions around the data sets that you would want to use and how to control them in different ways. And like, you know, could a large enough video generative model learn that elephants have solid tusks and learn all these lighting effects? I'm not sure. Uh, I think there's, that's what makes working in that space really exciting, but it also is so challenging due to the engineering complexity and the computation that's needed. Because like modeling images is hard, modeling video is certainly is harder in terms of the scale. Uh, and yet I think our largest video models right now are still substantially smaller than what we have for text. So it, it, I think it's like a very exciting area to, to work in, but also one that's extremely challenging. I don't know if that answers any of the questions, if there are more specifics. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I mean, there's, there's one question actually on, on YouTube as well. So what's the conditioning for the videos? Is it still going to be text? And then the question is, like, how does text basically describe motion in it? Yeah, I think um, that's a great question. So in Imagine Video, the conditioning was still uh, just based off of a static text caption. Um, there's some work like Finaki where you can do things like change that text prompt over time and then do autoregressive sampling to generate longer videos with dynamic text prompts. But I think text in general is a really horrible way of uh, designing and building systems. It's amazing in that now anyone can write text, but then if you really want to uh, change aspects of the image or the video, then you probably need something uh, control-wise that's more fine-grained than text. 
And you're also going to need, I think for video and for motion, um, it's really not clear. Uh, I, I think there, there hasn't been great evaluation to know like, well, do these text to video generative models understand moving to the left, moving to the right, um, especially if they're fine tuned from image models where they don't have access to that kind of dynamic motion. So I think we, we are going to need different kinds of data and different sources of supervision um, to enable better control of video generative models. And I think there's, uh, yeah, I think there's like been some cool work, uh, for example, from one runway using optical flow type features for like using the motion in one kind of control video to guide the generation. Um, but, but yeah, I think it's kind of an open question in terms of how to, how to like build controllable video generative models that match the kinds of generations that you want. And I think also just evaluating, well, these kind of more open world text to video systems, do they even understand actions? And I think what we've seen in the image space is these text to image systems uh, internally seem to have built up really rich representations for a lot of these things that we thought were really uh, kind of challenging to do and maybe would require more supervised data. But I think for video models, it's not really clear to me yet um, what what's going on internally and whether they're learning a lot of these interesting motion representations or whether we need to bake them in. Yep, I think it's interesting. I think videos, generally speaking, I mean, my personal opinion is it's pretty difficult. Um, I mean, it's just an order of magnitude more, right? You need another dimensionality kind of cover. Um, what's a gut feeling? Do you think we're going to train videos based on existing image models? Or do you think we kind of go straight to video generation right away? Like literally take the training on the videos and, and train on the dimension and diffuse over the time dimension as well? Yeah, I think there's been a few like different studies that have looked at this, like just training on video versus a mixture of video and images versus fine tuning from images. I think there's this question of how much data do you have and how much compute do you have? Um, I think if you have a ton of data and a ton of compute, then we know that training from scratch can often work better. Um, but I think you can get to a similar quality result by fine tuning as well. So I, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. I do feel like, um, at least in our work on 3D generation, it seems like building on what we do have and systems that do work, make a lot of sense. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think these are these are questions that are really hard to answer because it's not just a, it's not something you can reduce to like a finite video data set and trying out these different approaches. Now, if we really want to build systems that work for generating arbitrary videos, um, you know, I think I think it's not clear what the answers to some of these questions are going to be. But um, yeah, I think certainly like we shouldn't just throw out the text image systems that are amazing and incredible and people have put so much work into already. We should find ways of building on them for video models. But um, I think it could be, for example, I think there's some, I can't remember exactly which paper, but there were some results where if you train just on video versus if you train on video and images, the video models do better at dynamics and like your dyna the dynamics in the scene look better, but then they correspond less well to the text caption um, when you're just training on videos because the scale of video data sets that you're training on is smaller than the scale of text image data sets. Um, so I think there are always are going to be these trade-offs and depending on the application you're going after, you may want to do this fine tuning if you want more text correspondence or maybe more just training on videos if you care a lot about the dynamics. I don't think we have we don't have like one model that just works great at everything at the moment. Cool. Yeah, thanks. I guess I, I'll let you go slightly ahead. I think it's a little, yeah, little yeah, cool. Right now, but cool. I think it's good. Very cool. Yeah, thanks. I'm happy to field more questions on video generation um, later. But yeah, for me, my focus kind of shifted away from video to 3D generative models. I think one of the reasons was that, um, yeah, I, I guess we'll see in a second here. But I think one of the reasons is that 3D general modeling is hard. <laughs> Um, and I don't think we have the same kinds of, not necessarily simple, but the same kinds of strategies that exist that just work for 3D. Like they seem to be just working in some ways for images and video. Um, okay, so let's say we wanted to build 3D generative models. What do we do? I think you've heard some of my biases around using other models, but I think a lot of the work on 3D generation has kind of mirrored a lot of the work on text, image, and video generation, which is uh, what do we do? Well, first we're gonna collect a really big data set of 3D models. Um, and then in step two, we're just going to train a really big model on this really big 3D data set. And we just saw this worked okay for video. Um, so can we just do this for building high quality 3D generative models? Um, and the answer I think is mostly no, but I think we'll, I think it's still kind of up in the air. Um, and I think why? Well, first off, collecting or even uh, constructing 3D models is really challenging. It takes a lot of work from 3D modelers and artists and 3D assets are really expensive. Um, and even if you could collect all the 3D assets in the world that are legally scrapable, um, 
you know, that might be a few million 3D assets, which is way less than the scale of image and video data sets that we have access to. Um, and I think there's this other really huge problem with 3D, which is different from other modalities, which is that we don't really know how to represent it. Um, 3D assets are in all these different formats, often mesh-based, but then a lot of our generative model technology has been developed for things like voxels or point clouds. So we need to take this whole 3D data set, we need to commit to some way of representing it. Okay, maybe we chose to represent it as meshes. Now you need to design a really big architecture that we can scale up to this million or 10 million scale data set of 3D models that can also operate over meshes. And oftentimes these are really complicated discrete structures that neural networks have a hard time reasoning over. So I think for 3D, it's it's not only tricky on the data set front, but also on the representation front and on the architecture front. Um, and this makes it really hard to build these, uh, what we call direct 3D generative models. Um, but still, I think there's been a lot of cool progress here, especially in the past few months on collecting 3D data sets and also training models on them. Uh, on the left is an example uh, from NVIDIA, Get3D. Um, and we've also seen methods like Pointy and Shapey from OpenAI that have um, enable pretty fast synthesis of 3D models, but oftentimes the quality or diversity is reduced. And I think you're always going to be limited when you're training these 3D models to the set of 3D data that you have access to. Um, and in general, I feel like there's this really like unfathomable gap between the 3D models we have and the set of things in the visual world and then the set of things we dream up and want to create. And I don't know how we get there from 3D. I think even if everyone takes out their phones and starts scanning 3D objects now, I don't know how long it will be until we have enough data to train what you might call a 3D foundation model that could really reason over any object in the 3D world and figure out how to change cameras and viewpoints. Um, so to bridge this gap, I think we really need to find ways of relying and leveraging other kinds of data sets. Um, and in particular, our work has focused on finding ways of using 2D priors trained on images for 3D generation. Um, and unlike in 3D, we actually have uh, billions of image text pairs and large scale image data sets that we can use. We also have existing generative models like we saw for text to image diffusion um, that already work out of the box. And we have contrastive models that can embed images in text. So we have a lot of pretty mature technology for interacting with images. Um, so if we can find ways of using them for 3D generation, then maybe we don't need 3D data at all. And you know, I said we don't need 3D data, but like we still are trying to build a 3D model. So what are we going to use? Um, our work builds on NERF or neural radiance fields, which is this amazing technology for reconstructing 3D models from a large number of images. Um, and NERFs are pretty simple. The idea is just you have this 3D world around you, and we're going to think about representing that as a volume. And so at every point in the space, we're going to have a density and a color. And if we were to just represent a huge region of space with a volume, we'd have to have this really high memory way of representing it. So the idea behind a NERF is to have a simple neural network that takes us input, a coordinate in a three-dimensional space, and then outputs a color and an opacity um, at every one of these points. And if once we have this 3D volume, we can use differentiable volume rendering to take that volume and project it down to an image. Um, so this is a nice way of combining some of the expressivity of neural networks with some of the amazing advances in graphics and fast differentiable uh, volume rendering um, to enable 3D reconstruction. And I think it's pretty wild how far uh, NERFs have come. This isn't really my area of expertise, but it's been exciting to see. This is a, a video from ZipNERF, um, which is showing you there's a single uh, kind of neural network type representation here that's able to model this entire house, all of these details, um, indoor environments, outdoor environments. And so the quality of what we can do with 3D reconstruction right now is really, really incredible. Um, and But the downside is that training these nerfs requires walking around the scene and taking hundreds of images. And then once you have all these images, you need to not just know, uh, you know, not just take the image, you have to know exactly where that camera was. So you also have to do pose estimation. Um, and I think these technologies are getting better and more data efficient. Um, but, you know, maybe I want to create a bulldozer, but I don't have one in front of me. So it'd be great if I could find ways of not just having to go out there and take a lot of pictures. Uh, but maybe just having an idea in my head based off of text or some image and then lifting that into 3D. And then sometimes the things we want to create in 3D don't even exist in the world, uh, or they're really hard to get to stay still while you're doing a 3D capture, like a bear playing violin. Uh, and so we like to find ways of building on the amazing advances in generative 2D models to either reduce the data, kind of the data efficiency and the challenge of collecting 3D nurse, um, but also to enable us to create new things that haven't even existed in the world. Um, so how are we going to get there? Well, um, 
a lot of our work builds on this amazing work in 3D reconstruction. Um, and how does training a NERF work? Well, you start off with a randomly initialized neural network that outputs a color and density for every point in a three-dimensional space. Um, and then we take our set of captured images and we estimate their poses, and then we can differentiably render this 3D volume from a known camera pose. And then we can compare, well, how does every pixel in this rendered image look compared to the target captured image? So we can just use a simple reconstruction loss, which tells us exactly what these different pixels should look like at the known camera poses using the pictures that I went out and collected in the real world. But move from, when we're moving from reconstruction to generation, we don't have all these images of a scene. I just have something I want to create, uh, like a frog wearing a sweater. And so the idea is to replace this reconstruction loss, which supervised every pixel in the scene, with some kind of scoring loss, which says, well, I rendered this randomly initialized 3D model. I got this image out. Is this Does this look like a frog wearing a sweater? And then if we have this image text loss, which says, well, how, how well do these renderings look according to our uh, some kind of image model, um, then we can keep updating our 3D model until it looks better and better. So all that we really need now for 3D generation is a way of scoring these 2D uh, kind of 2D renderings. And we have kind of two approaches for this. The first was in a paper dream fields where the way that we scored this image rendering given some text was using a clip embedding similarity metric. Uh, and then in our work in Dream Fusion, we introduced the score distillation loss, which was a way of using a pre-trained text to image diffusion model to score a random rendering from a NERF um, with a given text prompt. Uh, so first I want to go through Dream Fields. Um, the, as I mentioned, we have a NERF. We render it from some random camera. We then can take this rendering and mat it onto different backgrounds. And then we can feed it through, I don't know if you guys have seen the clip models in your class, but these are models that train an image encoder and a text encoder. Um, and they're trained so that a data set on a data set of image text pairs, the embeddings on image and text are close. So here, what do we do? We take this kind of frozen pre-trained image encoder and text encoder. We embed the random rendering of our NERF and compare it to some text we want to create, like a boat on the water tied down to a stake. And then we can ask, well, how close is the image embedding to the text embedding? And the models are trained so that image text embeddings from the data set are high and all the other image text embeddings from random pairs are low. Um, and we just maximize this uh, kind of similarity um, and then get out 3D models. So this was a pretty simple idea that built on some of uh, Ajay Jain's work on um, diet nerf, which was a way of doing data efficient nerf using the an, two image encoders. Here we're going to use an image encoder and a text encoder from the pre-trained model. And if you look at the results that you get out from these clip-based text image generative systems, or sorry, text to 3D systems, you can see that they actually work pretty well sometimes. So here on the left are a bunch of teapots in different shapes. There's a teapot in the shape of ring coral or a Rubik's cube, and on the right are different armchairs. And what you see with a lot of these clip models is because they were trained to learn these joint embeddings of image and text, they often have a lot of features or textural elements that are reflective of uh, the text prompt, but then they lose a lot of the global coherence. So they're kind of like really good bag of words type models or bag of visual features models, but they don't have the same kind of uh, kind of amazing like 2D scene structure or 3D scene structure that we might want. Um, and while we were working on this text to 3D work with Dream Fields, everyone was uh, releasing and building these incredible text to image models. And everyone asked us, okay, well, you were using these contrastive losses for text to 3D generation. Um, is there a way that you could maybe use some loss based off of diffusion? And the big question that we spent many months working on was, well, what is this image text loss function and how do we get to it from a uh, text to image generative model? Whereas with Clip, we were able to just use something that looked a lot like the trading loss or the similarity between uh, the embeddings. And so why can't we just use this diffusion model out of the box? Like, isn't it, isn't it can I just use this 2D prior in some way as is to, to do 3D generation. I think the main issue is that the way that we do generation from diffusion models is in pixel space. It's on a pixel grid where we start off with a randomly sampled image or a randomly sampled latent vector. And we gradually introduce structure and remove noise from this grid of pixels until we get out a high quality image. And when we're thinking about 3D generation or more generally trying to generate good looking images from different kinds of parameterizations, Here's an example of maybe I want to I want to generate a sample that's symmetric. So I have parameters that are the right half of an image, and my generator just flips it over to the left half. Um, we don't know how to update the parameters of that model. We only know how to make these updates and moves in pixel space. 
So what we really want is something that looks like a loss function that we can use to score the images. And then if we had that, we can back, back propagate all the way back to the parameter space. Whereas the normal kind of updates that you get out of these different kinds of diffusion samplers, they're all iterative and apply directly to the pixels. There's not kind of this signal that we can back propagate to some kind of parameterized image. So what loss functions could we try? Well, we started off using the diffusion training loss and there's a bunch of math on the slide, um, but the, the general idea is we have a training loss that we use for the diffusion model. And normally when we train it, we minimize this loss function in terms of the parameters of the diffusion model, but we freeze the data set X. So you give me a data set and then I update the parameters of my model to minimize this loss. And this loss is um, a weighted sum of denoising score matching objectives. So it's kind of training this denoising model across many different noise levels. So what if we took our frozen pre-trained model, so we've trained the model, now we have these parameters phi, and then I can minimize this loss function uh, in terms of the data set while freezing the parameters. So we can swap while we're optimizing over. And in practice, we found that this loss didn't work. Um, I think one intuition for why this loss function is not useful for 3D generation, can you can kind of see from the decomposition of the gradient of this loss function with respect to the parameters of the image. And there's three terms that show up here. Um, and I think we're, we'll go back into this in a second, but there's a middle term here, which is the Jacobian of the unit of the denoising model. So this is kind of saying how sensitive is the denoising model to perturbations in the input. And in neural networks, we often know that the uh, sensitivity to perturbations, for example, uh, from adversarial examples, I can make small perturbations of the input and fool the network, um, are often, oftentimes these kind of higher order gradients through neural networks are poorly behaved. Uh, so we found that dropping this term actually helped a lot for using this loss function for generation. Uh, we didn't actually get to this loss function through the diffusion training loss. We, we got there from a different perspective. Um, but this update, which we call score distillation sampling, um, can be related to the gradient of a, another loss, um, which is based off of a technique called probability density distillation. And the idea behind probability density distillation is we might have some complex distribution here in black, um, that I'm denoting with P of X. This is like, what is the distribution that a fusion model learned over images? And we don't want to sample a bunch of images. Maybe I just want to sample a single image. So how do I learn a single or unimodal distribution that can match this complex multimodal distribution? Um, and probability density distillation was a method that was developed for speeding up sampling in audio models, uh, but we can also use it to try to fit a simple distribution that kind of has a single image with noise added to this complex diffusion distribution. And as we talked about before in this continuous perspective on diffusion models, uh, we don't just have a single level of this uh, diffusion process, we have the data convolved with all these different levels of noise. And so we can weight the, this distillation loss across these different noise levels to get our final score distillation based loss. So this was a bunch of math, but I think how to use it is uh, intuitive, intuitive and pretty easy. We're gonna start off with a set of parameters theta that we wanna optimize. Our goal is to have the generated image from these parameters to look good. So we start off with our parameters, we render it to an image X. Then we run the forward diffusion process by randomly drawing some noise um, and a random, taking a random time step in the diffusion process T to get a noisy image. And here's where we can are actually using the knowledge from this pre-trained text to image model. We're gonna take that noisy input image, and then we're gonna denoise it using this text conditioned diffusion model. That gives us a clean looking image in pixel space. And then we can convert this to a prediction of the noise that was added, uh, which is kind of the negative direction of the square function. This is saying, which way should I move to go to a more likely image based off of the, uh, the distribution that the diffusion model has learned. And we can denoise this estimate of, kind of denoise this direction a little bit by subtracting off the initial noise that was added. And this gives us our final direction that we want to move in pixel space. But that's a direction in pixel space. How do we get that back into parameter space? Well, we can just use the Jacobian of the generator to back propagate that back from pixel space into parameter space. Um, so this is just one iteration of what a update might look like when using the score distillation loss to optimize the parameters of a model. In practice, we start with random, uh, some randomly initialized model and then run many iterations. Here in the lower left is an example of a pixel grid that we optimize over and over again to the text prompt of Peacock on a surfboard. This is all in 2D. How do we get to 3D? Well, it's pretty darn simple. We take 
the, this amazing technology for 3D construction NERF. And now we have a neural network with parameters theta that parameterizes a volume in three-dimensional space that has a density and color for every point. And at each iteration, we randomly render this 3D model to get out an image, use score distillation to get an update in pixel space, and then we can back propagate that through the entire differentiable rendering process back into the volume, back into the parameters of this NERF. Um, so that's it, we just swap in our differentiable NERF rendering and outcomes 3D models. And I think this, the sad reality of research is it's not often that simple. So here on the left is an old video from uh, June of last year. The kind of left-hand uh, panel here is showing a 3D generation for a painted turtle. And this is kind of going over iterations of randomly sampling the views and looking at the viewpoints. And then on the right, uh, this is what we ended up releasing with in October. Um, so there was a lot of work that went on between this initial research idea and some initial progress and actually having high quality 3D assets. So what were those some of those tricks? Um, here on the top left, you can see a stuffed animal reading a book. It's got multiple heads. It's not a really great single 3D stuffed animal. Uh, one trick that we found was really useful for the Imagine model was to add in view dependent prompts. So to give the diffusion model a coarse sense of what kind of content should be occurring from which angle you sample the camera. And this helps a lot with the 3D geometry that you get out. And uh, I think only recently um, have there been some some new open source models that I think also show these similar kinds of capabilities, but there's been a lot of cool tricks people have developed on top of stable diffusion for getting more effectiveness out of these view dependent prompts. Um, but then if you take this 3D asset and you shade it, like let's say I built a, a 3D asset and wanted to put it into a video game with different lighting, you can see that the underlying geometry uh, is not very smooth or realistic. So we were also added in random illumination and shading at training time, which helps a lot with improving the quality of some of these 3D assets. And there's a few more tricks and definitely check out the paper and bug me if you have any questions. Um, but it, it really was a, a long process from just some initial uh, decent kind of 3D creation. So something that is really robust and usable. So overall, this Dream Fusion system, which is really just uh, kind of the same thing as Dream Fields, but plugging in the diffusion loss, is able to produce some pretty high quality 3D assets just from text. The left, I think these are some of the most fun. This is it creating this 3D thing from random, a randomly initialized nerf. And this generation process isn't all like what you would do as a human or a sculptor for creating these things in 3D. It's a very weird path that you take from a randomly initialized nerf to an entire 3D model. But um, it seems like somehow these text of 3D systems have figured, figured out a way of doing this. Um, and once you have these 3D models, you can take them and mesh them. You can put them in augmented reality. Or the most fun I had was 3D printing them. And then I got to hand out a bunch of little 3D assets when I presented this work at iClear. And based off of this text to image system that we're building on, we can now do text to 3D for all sorts of different interesting text prompts. Um, here's kind of a, a bunch of 3D assets. You can see there's like a dinosaur and a robot playing chess. Um, and you can really get a huge diversity of generations uh, thanks to the power of these text to image models. And my hope is as the text to image models gets better, all of our text to 3D systems will also get better too. Um, and then you can take these systems and do things like design 3D characters with text. I can take a photo of a squirrel to start off with. I can dress it in a kimono or a suit of medieval armor, send it to a ceramics class, um, or put it on a motorcycle. So even just having text as a control mechanism here can still allow you to create all sorts of really cool 3D assets um, that for me personally would be extraordinarily challenging to generate and create and repose. I kind of went through these. There's, uh, I think 3D printing is like, I learned about it after doing all of this work, and it's been so fun to, to try to take these generations that are just on a computer and really bring them to life. Um, and then more recently, we had some work that was just accepted to ICCD, uh, Dream Booth 3D, which is instead of just depending on text to do these 3D creations, maybe you have a set of pictures, but maybe you're trying to, trying to capture a, a 3D model of your dog and your dog's moving around and not behaving well. Um, so we had a way of taking the underlying diffusion model and fine tuning and adapting it um, based off of a set of images that you have of a subject. And this enables us to do uh, text to 3D generation for that particular subject. And once you have that, you can do things like change the text prompt um, to, uh, to put your pet in different clothes or to dress them in an umbrella, or have an umbrella on top of them or other fun things. So um, because we've kind of built on top of these diffusion models, a lot of the stuff that works for diffusion models, fine tuning and adapting, we can also bring over into the 3D domain. And I think some days I am super excited about the possibilities of generative 3D um, and how far we can get uh, even without any 3D or multi-view data. 
And I think it's been so cool to see the rapid pace of research in this area. Um, there was Magic 3D that enabled high quality meshing, Make a Video 3D that did dynamic 3D scenes using a video prior, Latent Earth, which sped things up by doing things in latent space, Vector Fusion, use these kind of score distillation losses for optimizing vector graphics. So it's been really cool to see what some of these methods have enabled. Um, but at the same time, if you talk to people, you know, I went to my first ever vision conference, um, CVPR this year, and you talk to people and you see the quality of results that, that folks are getting in more specific domains. Um, our results look pretty bad. They're gross, they're oversaturated, they're cartoony, the quality is too low, the beta front and prompt is a gross hack, score distillation, I feel like is this frustrating, horrible hack. So I think there is still so much to be done to improve the quality and utility of these 3D systems, but I'm excited that we kind of have um, kind of have this start and, and can do something at least without 3D and multi-view data. I think just to give you an idea of like how these systems fail, I think a lot of the results on our website and the results that you see in papers are so cherry picked. But if you try to run a few prompts through these systems, you'll often see uh, some pretty weird but predictable failures. Um, the snake in the top left, it might be hard if it's choppy over Zoom, but it has a few extra eyes and a few extra heads. And one of the reasons is because it's a snake wearing a beret, the top view, which often kind of shows the model that there's something weird about the number of heads that are present is blocked because we're sampling random cameras and then there might be only a, a very few number of camera views that you sample where you actually see that something is weird about the 3D geometry. And in this line playing violin in the lower left, you can see that from some angles, it takes the bow of the violin and adds in some like wooden structure on the side so that when you're looking at it from the side, you really can see the violin and not just the bow. Uh, so it's really hard in general to, to try to create a 3D model just from these 2D views. And I'm not sure if the approaches that we've built are gonna ever solve this problem. It seems like it's so hard to really capture just the right views to know what's going on in the 3D geometry. And then I think one other bit that I am eternally frustrated by is the loss function that we've developed in score distillation is broken in a number of ways. I think one of the biggest ways in which it is broken is that we really need uh, what's called high classifier free guidance strength for these to work. And this is a knob that was developed in diffusion models. And normally in diffusion models, um, this is kind of left or right in this figure here. Normally in diffusion models, when you have a low guidance strength, you have a high diversity in samples, but they might have worse correspondence with the text or the class. And as you increase guidance, you often get less diversity, but higher quality single images out. Um, in 3D, what happens, or sorry, with score distillation sampling, that was with ancestral sampling, with score distillation sampling that we're using for 3D, when we turn this knob down, we don't get lots of diversity, but worse quality. We, get we basically get random gray images. Um, and what that means is we have to use this very large guidance strength for text to 3D generation. And that often results in some of this oversaturation and also reduced diversity in the generations that we get out. Ideally, I kind of don't even want to tell you what to put in the 3D model or in every part of a 3D model, and you can still piece something together. So I think this is a huge problem for using score distillation in general in any, any application is that it really is um, mode seeking. And high dimensional spaces are really weird in a way where if you look at just the random high dimensional Gaussian distribution, that has a mean zero and variance like sigma, then the highest density point, if you're doing optimization to say, well, what's the point of the space that has the highest density? That's kind of at zero. Um, but if you look at basically any typical sample from this distribution, that will be at some particular radius. So it's kind of concentrating on this shell far away from um, the mode. And these optimization -based, based approaches, I think they all effectively fall into modes. And we need to find more interesting ways of repelling them. And I think that's, this is something that's really hard to reason about in Lodi space, but when we're thinking about building models and loss functions that work well in high dimensions, this is a huge trap to, to worry about and to think about. Um, so, okay, how are we gonna get around these issues with score distillation? I think this is a thing that's bugged me a lot recently. Um, and there's, I, this is just a handful of, of ways. I think one version, number three on this list is just like build something better. And I'm really hopeful that someone will come up with something better. There's been some cool recent work um, prolific dreamer that has a somewhat adversarial approach for uh, finding um, an alternative to the score distillation loss. Um, but I think there's other approaches that could work well too. So we've seen increasingly uh, that you can collect reasonably scaled 3D data sets and we can find ways of fine tuning 2D models to be a little bit more 3D aware. And either of these approaches, I think, avoid some of the challenges of score distillation when you have a lot of uncertainty and you average over it 
If you know exactly what should be there, then these same kinds of loss functions work. And it's been super exciting to see uh, a lot of progress recently on image and post condition models um, that are able to take an image and then train a diffusion model or adapt a diffusion model to, to kind of learn to rotate or to transform this image in 3D, in, in 3D space. And then once you have a diffusion model that roughly knows what to put there, you can clean it up and distill it into a high quality 3D asset. So um, this is some work on Nerf Diff, um, which was training from scratch on ShapeNet objects. But then we've also seen ways, I think some of the most exciting work right now in generative 3D is thinking about how to combine pre-trained diffusion models that know a lot about the 2D space with some amount of 3D data and fine tuning to make them a little bit 3D aware. Um, so there's been some cool work like GenBS and Sparse Fusion. And I think especially recently, the work on 0, 1, 2, 3, um, uh, combined with 0, 1, 2, 3 and the new Objectverse data sets, uh, we can kind of take these 2D models and adapt them so that they know a little bit more about the 3D world. And once they do, now it becomes easier to extract out consistent 3D models. Um, so I think there's a ton of room to explore on the architecture front, on the fine tuning front for adapting these 2D models to 3D. Um, and I think that's a super exciting direction for enabling not only uh, higher quality generation, but also more controllable. I think text is not the way that we want to create 3D things. If I can, if I'm a designer and I can adjust things in 2D and then lift that into 3D, that's a, I think, a way more effective workflow. So I think it's really exciting times for thinking about how to piece all these uh, different bits together from all these different ways of modeling and fine tuning. Okay, so to conclude, I think I'm I'm sometimes excited, sometimes frustrated, but um, I think it's very cool how 2D priors can enable effective 3D generation. Um, in our work, we found that using the score distillation approach on top of text to image models can be a great way of lifting 2D text to image diffusion priors into 3D. I think the thing that I've always been really excited about in this work is that 2D models are getting better. You know, we're seeing all these updates uh, for open source models as well as closed source models for image generation. Um, they're getting better, they're getting more controllable. And now we have a tool that can take these 2D uh, improvements and lift them into 3D. Um, but still, I think there's so much left to do. I think there's these fundamental methodological issues in terms of uh, loss functions. And, but I think there's so much in terms of quality that's not quite there yet. You know, we talked about taking nerfs and meshing them, but how do you actually make the topology useful? Um, how do you make these dynamic? I think speed is one of the biggest things. It takes 30 minutes for our existing system. How could you make this interactive? Uh, and I think also like talking more with uh, artists and designers and understanding, well, what do you, what's currently really frustrating in your 3D pipeline and how can we make it better? Um, and then how do we use all these different kinds of data sources? We don't just wanna use 2D, we have video, we have multi-view data. How could we build a big model that could take all of this knowledge of the visual world and then use it for 3D systems? I think is like uh, one of the coolest questions right now and one where there, I don't think there is an obvious answer, which is I think different from a lot of the amazing work going on right now in uh, text image and video generation, which is that we know how to scale these up. I think unlike that, 3D is still uh, very mysterious and fun. Uh, so with that, thank you guys for, for staying up late. Um, and happy to answer any questions. Cool, thanks so much. By the way, it's not so late, it's like 8 p.m., it's, it's okay. We, we Anytime after 5 p.m. is late. <laughs> right, maybe it's Google. <laughs> not in academia. Okay, um, yeah, cool. Um, does anybody have some questions? I mean, if you're on Zoom or so, you can just ask some questions. If you're on YouTube, just yeah, talk to the chat. Uh, yeah. Uh, hey, first of all, uh, thank you for a very exciting talk. Uh, so I have one question. If I uh, get the high level approach, so it's like you are using the uh, text to image generator to uh, generate some view dependent images and then uh, use NARF to fuse them into, into 3D model, right? Uh, so at, at very high level uh, with, without going into much details. But my question is, uh, when you do the text to image generation, how do you constrain uh, on the shape? For example, let's say if I say an uh, image of a chair, now this chair can be of different types and in different, uh, even if you do different views, in different views, the chair shape can be completely changed, like because the, let's say chair object is completely changed and color also can yeah. be changed. So how do you control that? Yeah, so I think the the main, um, I think it's a great question. I think that the main way that we control that or deal with that is that we don't actually run text image generation for these different prompts. Um, what I think about like score distillation is doing is uh, it's effectively giving us a direction to move, not a target image. So we're not generating like 10 different images and then fitting a nerve to these 10 different images. Because as you said, those different sets of images would be pretty inconsistent. They could be very different shares or in different poses. 
Um, the idea is that we have this iterative optimization process where at each step we are querying kind of one step of this diffusion model and asking us how should I nudge the current image to look a little bit more like the text prompt. Um, and this iterative process then accumulates into the parameters of the NERF and is what gives us our resulting 3D model. Uh, so we're not actually generating, a, we're not running the diffusion sampler um, some number of times to generate good high quality images and then distilling those into a 3D model. I think about this as just kind of querying the score functions of the diffusion model to give us what's the little direction that I should move or change right now to improve the quality of the result. Okay, so you mean uh, when you query the diffusion with the, with the score, the next image, is it from the another view or is it from the same view, do you mean like? Yeah, in our case, we query it from like a random view at each iteration. So you can think about if you had like kind of batch size one, um, at each iteration, we randomly choose a pose, we render the image, we randomly choose a single time step in the diffusion process, and that gives us our noisy image, and then we get a target out for how we should change this image a little bit. Um, and okay. the updates that we're making aren't, so here, for example, we don't do many updates to the parameters to pull the rendered image towards the denoised image x hat, or to, to pull it towards some target image. We just do one kind of infinitesimal step. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's through accumulating all these small steps that we get out our resulting high quality image. So we never have to run the full, we're never actually running like the full diffusion sampling process at training time. We're only ever querying one step at a time. Um, and we're querying each step kind of randomly in terms of the pose and in terms of the time step. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the question. I think that's one of the um, like biggest points of confusion and something we actually tried at, at one point, which was, could you just generate a ton of images from this diffusion model and then do some kind of like robust nerf that fit to a few of them? Maybe you could get a few good views out. And I think the reality is that in these high dimensional spaces, it's going to be really hard to generate a bunch of views of a chair that are all exactly that same chair and are all multi-view consistent. Um, but then methods uh, like zero, one, two, three, um, that can take an image and then can generate a set of almost multi-view consistent images. Once you have that, now there's a lot of different approaches you could start thinking about for distilling it and making it faster. Um, so I think that's where a lot of the, I think, exciting research is these days too, which is, well, score distillation and some of these methods don't work well uh, or don't, you know, they have a bunch of flaws. Could you bypass that by having models that could generate a collection of multi-view consistent images and then we can just use our standard 3D reconstruction technology to improve them? Um, so something that like we couldn't get working just based off of text conditioning, but when you have image and pose conditioning, I think some of these alternative approaches for building 3D models could start working. Any other questions? I, yeah. I, got, I, got a, I got a more high level question. So at the moment, it seems a lot of works right now, they basically focus on doing distillation to optimize one specific nerve for one model, right? Mm -hmm. So how far do you think we would be away? I mean, I understand SDS is not, not easy to apply in practice. I understand there's a lot of hyperparameters, how to sample, prompts, stuff like that. There's a lot of different things. But how do you think mm -hmm. how far we would be away from using this in a generative learning framework, right? So you're saying like you have like an MLP that generates your 3D nerves, like each 3 d style, um, but you wanted to have 2D supervision from a diffusion model. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we're already, in some ways we're already there. Like there's been some papers on fast, um, text to 3D synthesis by amortizing this process. I, I, in my head, I think the score distillation loss is still bad and is going to bottleneck a lot of these approaches. But, um, but yeah, it, it feels like we're relatively close to having like efficient zero. Just having a feed forward model that can take some conditioning signal and output some 3D representation without having to do this extra optimization step. It feels like we're not so far off with a few extra tricks. Um, and I think if you initialize in certain ways or you combine this with some of the adversarial approaches, uh, I think you could do a lot. But at the same time, I think this abandoning score distillation in favor of some of these models that know how to do pose conditioning and can take an image and rotate it means that you don't need this optimization approach. And then you can kind of get out a 3D model in um, 45 seconds. There was a recent paper that did this. So uh, I think in some ways this is a like it can be a useful solution. And I think score distillation is a, like these kinds of approaches we have based off of the optimization are effective at taking a decent solution and improving it or nudging you a little bit closer, but they're not great with diversity. They exhibit some of this kind of same kind of mode collapse that you see in GANs too. So I think it's like, I think we're not quite there yet, but I feel like um, I think before 
someone asked me this question, I said it in a year, and now I feel like there's already signs of life um, from a few different research labs. Like there was amortized text to 3D. Um, and then the GAN-based generative approaches are fast and they do work really well. So I think that there's probably ways of combining all these things to do efficient 3D generation. And then there's a question of, well, what are the conditioning signals that you want to bake in? Um, and, and you have to commit to a 3D representation in this generative model ahead of time. So which one do you choose and at what resolution and with what diffusion model? Um, but yeah, I'm pretty excited. It does feel like they're, we're not so far off from making these really fast and useful. Cool, any other questions? I'm stealing from one of the students and not me. I, mean, I, I also I got a one. question. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, right now there's like this huge chunk of, okay, we want to condition in text and it's like super useful to broad send a community, basically. Everyone can just type something in, but it's like also super noisy signal. And I mean, uh, what we've been previously using is like pretty accurate uh, 3D input, like input we want to work on basically like partial point clouds or um, I mean also images as reference. Um, but my feeling is that they usually just been, I don't know, globally used, like encoded in some way and using used as condition. And that I guess these high compressed condition will not be able to uh, uh, yeah, basically yeah, um, can contain all the details about the original input. Um, so mm -hmm. do you have any comment on how to condition better? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of feel like this is the biggest question, like how to condition combined with how to condition in a way that you can reuse things you've learned on 2D. Um, and I think like uh, this freedom model, for example, from Daniel Watson that was doing image and pose condition diffusion, like took that input image and then broke it up into a bunch of patches and then cross attention. And how you condition on the signal um, ends up being really important for having the enough expressivity to do these kinds of transformations. But I think there's also a question with 3D, which is that we are never going to have enough data. So what are the right kinds of inductive biases for novel view synthesis? And I feel like that's some of like the um, some of like the most interesting questions right now that we need to start experimenting in. So there's methods like GenVS, which takes that image and then run something like pixel nerf to get out a, a 3D set of features that you then project to the new view. There's other methods that use different kinds of epipolar features or like IBR net image-based rendering approaches. And I, I think like these methods we know are pretty good inductive biases, work well from small data sets, um, but then we need to find ways of combining them with, well, how do I reuse this general 2D structure of pixels? Um, and so I think there is a lot of different approaches for how to condition. I don't think I, I know yet myself. I'm excited to like play around more with different forms of conditioning on image observations and poses. Um, I, I do hate like the pose bottleneck um, and making these things work in the real, like how do you make these things work in the real world from a collection of images um, without poses and without camera intrinsics? I think these are all really tricky questions, but my hope is that people who know more than me about 3D vision and 3D geometry can come up with more informed decisions of how to add these extra uh, bits of conditioning into the diffusion models. And then even when you fine tune pretty large scale diffusion models on a small amount of 3D or multi-view data, hopefully that will then generalize better because we've baked in a lot of good 3D inductive biases. That's one version. Another version is um, all this stuff is useless and we should just focus on more data and then how you condition won't really matter. Um, and I'm not sure which of those is the best bet at the moment. Cool. Thanks a lot. Okay, there's there's one question on YouTube. I guess I answer it kind of, but <laughs> so one question on YouTube is basically how much of a role will you know other domains play, like graphs, meshes, and stuff like this. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think there's a lot a lot that we focused on on just like optimizing volumes that has nothing to do with a bunch of things that have to happen for 3D generative models to be useful. I think one is like materials. So like, I don't just, I, you know, okay, these are good looking 3D renderings, but they're just using uh, diffuse lighting. They don't have any like specularities. And so there's, I think a lot more to be learned from the 3D models that we do have in terms of material properties, also topology. So like if you run an automatic meshing algorithm on a NERF, 
the meshes you get out, if you show them to anyone who does 3D modeling, they'll say it's totally garbage and useless. Um, you really want like triangles at articulation points and, and then you need to rig this thing. So I think there's a lot of complexity that uh, I don't even, I didn't even know when I started working on this stuff. And that is really essential to building useful 3D models um, where I think some of these other approaches um, and other data sets, I think are gonna be absolutely critical. Like, could you automatically learn how to uh, bake a good topology into a mesh based off of 3D model data? or learn what's kind of the right um, distributions for albedo uh, and like specular coefficients. So there, I think there's a lot that hasn't, you know, that, that we're not even approaching in this work that is so essential for 3D generative modeling that I know a lot of other people are working on, but uh, yeah, I think all these other things are going to be useful at some point in this process. I think there'll always be this question in any work that you do, uh, which maybe I just feel this way because I work at Google, which has a lot of large scale models, which is um, how can you make use of what these other models are learning. Because they are learning really useful things about the world. They're hallucinating a lot of stuff, but for generative models, I think we know that there's a lot of, you know, to build a good video generative model, you have to learn a lot about dynamics and then dynamic priors would be really useful for other applications in dynamic 3D. Um, so I think, I think it's, we need to think about how to leverage these other domains and other models while still building on top of these data-driven approaches. Uh, and I think, yeah, definitely the work on meshes in particular and topology and materials. I, I feel like those are all really essential to get these things really useful. Cool. Any other questions yet? Yeah, I was asking the same thing. I mean, I have many more questions. I, I mean, I'm gonna ask <laughs> yeah. one. Um, okay, everybody talks about diffusion. Why do you think this hasn't been possible with GANs? All right, you could imagine you have like few, few base discriminators, like in principle, you get gradients too. Why can't we do that? Yeah, I, I guess in general, there's like for, let's just say for text image generation, um, I just presented a, a grumpy slide at a workshop, which was, I, I kind of feel like all these other approaches can be made to work. So um, I, I've i done more research in diffusion models than the, the body of work I'm familiar with, but people have also scaled up autoregressive generation in Dolly and Party, and the text image results are um, of equal or better quality sometimes. Um, people have also scaled up GAN-based approaches like GigaGAN. So, for text image synthesis, I do feel like it's less about the particular model and method and more about do you have a handful of people who have the compute and are willing to explore this hyperparameter space to make that model work. Um, for 3D, I think there's a question of how to scale up 3D GANs, which is that we often need access to pose information. And for a random collection of images, you don't necessarily also have the poses and more restricted domains. You could maybe run pose estimators and then condition the discriminator on those. But I yeah, I, I kind of feel like wide diffusion in general is just a, this is one of many hammers and it seems to be one that we have uh, some architectures that we know how to scale and it seems to scale stably. Some other approaches like GAN-based methods um, can be made to scale, but there's only like a handful of people in the world that know all the right tricks. Um, I think diffusion is maybe also similar. It's just that uh, people have open sourced and shared more of those models and made it easier to build on them. So I think it's, I, I think like wide diffusion is just like it's, currently the hot method and people have invested a lot of compute into it, but I'm excited for whatever is next too. Um, there's one more question on YouTube, which is how do we get to web scale 3D data? Is it, I mean, I guess the question is, is it ever possible? Yeah, I mean, my, my, my bet knowing very little about 3D is I don't, I don't see how. I think the folks that worked on Objiverse and Objiverse XL worked really, really hard to scrape as many 3D assets as possible from the internet and got up to like 10 million. Um, I think there's other really challenging questions too about web scale 3D data, which is uh, the actual 3D assets are so challenging to create and a bunch of artists and models put so much work into them. And so thinking about how, um, how to engage them in this process and to make sure that the use of 3D models is not only legal, but ethical, I think that's a really challenging question. Um, I think the same question can be said for all these other modalities, but it's, yeah, I, I, I don't really know how to get to like web scale 3D data. I think that um, more and more of our devices have things like depth sensors or LIDAR. So increasingly, like as there's progress in sensor technology, maybe we have more kinds of data sets that are useful for 3D. But I, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like not sure. I think Objiverse XL and the folks that work on that know far better than I do about um, what the scale is of web 3D data, but my kind of my bet and my hope is uh, we'll always want to find ways of adapting 
other modalities like video and images. Um, and like the video and image models are not getting worse, they are getting better. Uh, and if we can find ways of adapting them to 3D, I think that will kind of guarantee success. Whereas um, for 3D, like web scale 3D data, even if you have that data, like you still got to figure out what to do with it. Um, and it's often of objects and not scenes. And there's like so much in the world that I don't think there are 3D assets for yet. No one's taken the work to scan them or, um, and like what fidelity would you need to scan them at for it to be useful, I think is also really challenging. So I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. My, my thought is like, in talking with the Optiverse XL team, they've done a, a great job of scraping everything that they could. Um, but it's, I think there's like so many question marks around not only how to scale it up, but like how to make sure that we do so in a, a way that um, is also like enabling a lot of 3D modelers and creators versus just taking advantage of all the, the hard work that they put in. Right. Um, so maybe one follow up there. So I'm actually a strong believer of combining modalities, right? So you could argue you're going to have a lot of 2D data to learn generic priors, and then you're going to have, I don't know, like you have some, some smaller data set in a sense. I don't know if like fine tuning is the right term here, but learning some priors in a sense, like how 3D shapes should look like, um, like planar surfaces, right? Like hard edges, stuff like this. So this is something you could probably do in a smaller data set, but then the, the, the channelization across identities and multi-class objects, maybe for that one, you need 2D data. I don't know, what's, what's your take on this one? Like also methodology wise, how would it even work to combine these modalities? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. I think like knowing that most animals you generate have one head, like that's not hard. That probably doesn't take a lot of 3D data and that would probably help a lot um, with, with many of the issues we're facing. So I do feel like there's huge value add in having these explicit 3D priors, even if they're built out of smaller scale data sets. Uh, Matias, I think like you asked, it's like not, how do you combine them? And it, it becomes more of like a system question than a what I think is like a, I don't think there is a right answer. I think like all of these are useful learning signals from all these different modalities. And then how you piece them together is like a really complex engineering puzzle. I don't know if there's like one do you think it's just an solution. Do you think it's just an engineering puzzle? I think it's actually not that straightforward in a sense because um, like, as you mentioned, SDS in itself is already very well finicky in a sense, right? If you can, if you come, I don't know, I'm just making some stuff up. Let's say you're combining like yeah. SDS with like a, a, a 3D discriminator that tells you, oh, you need like sharp edges or so. I'm not so sure yeah. this would work right away. Yeah, so I, I guess maybe, yeah, I didn't mean to say just an engineering solution. Uh, it's more than just an engineering problem. I think it's like an extraordinarily challenging research question. Um, but I think like if it, when it, when it becomes like that, when it's like balancing a lot of different things carefully, I always worry about how you scale up those systems and like how brittle they become to other design choices that you make. But, but yeah, I, I do feel like finding ways of, um, taking advantage of the pros and cons of all these different data sets and modeling approaches we have is really like, that is really important and really challenging. And I do think that like, if you tacked on a GAN discriminator on top of Dream Fusion, it could easily tell that our colors are really different. The color distribution is really different. Um, you could fix that with the GAN discriminator. Uh, why didn't we do that? I think because it was like, adds a bunch of complexity to tack onto the system that we've built. Um, but I think there's a lot of, I think finding ways of like taking advantage of uh, like 3D shape priors and like general, like what do um, creatures look like and how many limbs do they have? Like these are things that we should be using and doing to build a robust system, especially when we don't have a lot of data. I think the question is like, could we get there? Is there a data driven path to, to kind of fit that all together? Um, and the answer might be no for 3D and then we need to start thinking about it really carefully. Or the answer might be, well, we just need to be more creative with the data sources that we're using. Um, and then hopefully the data can speak more to what are the right kinds of priors. But it's hard because in 3D, we always only have these projections. We have very few true 3D models that are out there. Um, so I think it's, it may be in 3D, it will always be this back and forth balance. But I'm new to 3D and I come from machine learning. So I'm optimistic that data will steamroll everything. Uh, so I think we gotta, we still have to see. Cool, all right. Any last question from anybody here on Zoom? Do you think 3D or procedural generation of 3D data can maybe answer the question whether we can scale up things? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think something I didn't talk about is that this whole space is horrible in terms of metrics and evaluation and understanding what's happening. You kind of like write a paper, you show some flashy cherry picked examples and they're like, wow, look at these, aren't these so beautiful? And I think that having better evaluations on synthetic data or procedurally generated environments 
would definitely help. We don't have anything like scaling laws for 3D. The Optiverse XL paper kind of hinted at some of these, um, at least when you're training on these 2D, uh, 2D projections or multi-view data. Um, but yeah, I think having better synthetic data for evaluating these models and systems and understanding why they work and like what their failures are could be really important to understanding what these different kinds of trade-offs are as well. Because if you, you know, if if you say, okay, if we had 10x more 3D assets, then things would get this much better, then that I think motivates the collection or the the work on trying to generate those additional assets. Um, and I think in the text image space, people are starting to look at this with different kinds of benchmarks on compositionality. So having kind of uh, procedurally generated content and then using that to investigate, well, what's the distribution of what the system creates versus uh, what we know to be the truth. So I, I think there should be a lot more room for um, using synthetic, synthetic data, not only for evaluation, but like understanding what these trade-offs are. That's a, a really great idea. Matt, you have this opinion. Thanks. Yeah, cool. Thanks a lot, Ben. Um, and thanks, everybody, for joining. So I'm going to first end the YouTube stream. Um, thanks, everybody, on YouTube. Um, I hope this was exciting and inspires you a little bit to do research. Um, I personally think it's amazing. I think Ben's work and his team's work is great. And it's really something you should you should aim to mimic. Okay, let me end here.